If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Jerry, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 252 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Dwoskin. Great to have you back for what's sure to be another one of the bradiest episodes in the history of Classic Conversations. Here's a story of a lovely lady who is bringing up three very lovely girls. And we have one of those girls here today. <laughs> Susan Olson, Cindy Brady, is joining me on the show today. We're diving into the bunch. And more importantly, we're going deep into the Brady Bunch Variety Hour. Susan co-wrote an amazing book on that. Love to love you, Brady's. We're going to chat all about that. And that's coming up in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, just a reminder of last week, we hit the milestone 250 episodes with Burt Ward, Robin from TV's Batman. Followed that up with an awesome interview with Alex Winter about his new documentary, The YouTube Effect. Check those out, but don't check them out until after you've checked out this brady Riffic episode with Susan Olson. You know I love the Bradys. I talked to Lloyd Schwartz in episode 134, Christopher Knight in episode 226, Robbie Riss, Cousin Oliver in episode 152. I've even talked to a couple of Marsha's boyfriends, Michael Gray, episode 248, Nicholas Hammond, the big man on campus in episode 284. So much Brady goodness. I love the Bradys. And I loved my conversation with Susan Olson. I'm excited to share it with you. Enjoy. All right, everyone. I'm excited to introduce you to my next guest, TV icon and member of the Brady family. We love her as the youngest one in curls. Welcome to the show, Cindy Brady herself, Susan Olson. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to have you here. When doing my research... Susan, I discovered that you had written a book. You had co-authored a book, Love to Love You, Brady's The Bizarre Story of the Brady Bunch Variety Hour. I got the book. Yay! I read it. I want to dive into it because I've had Bruce Flanch and Steve Bluestein on my show. Oh, good. So we, I've talked to both of them and Christopher Knight briefly. We talked about it. Oh, my God. That is a deep dive. That goes into a lot of detail that I was not aware of. Yeah, it's my friend, Ed. He wanted to write a book about the Variety Hour just because it's such a strange anomaly. And for a while there, there were a few videos up on YouTube. And people were like, oh my gosh, I thought I was misremembering this. This was real. It wasn't a bad dream. It really happened. There was, there was an actual series called the Brady Bunch Variety Hour. And he wanted to do a book on it. And he just wanted me to write a foreword. And then he said, well... Why don't you write all the sidebars? I'd like to have you throughout the book. And I said, I have a suggestion since the whole thing was like a technicolor overdose and so full of glitter. It was such a visual spectacular. Why don't you make a coffee table book out of it? And he's like, oh, great idea. I said, I know I have a friend who's in graphic arts as I had been. Um, I said, she's better than me though. Her name is Lisa Sutton. And I said, get together with her, create a coffee table book about this. And I'll write the sidebars. And so I did a little bit of the graphic work. Picture of us all in the toilet at the end. I, I did that. But I wrote the sidebars. And what Ted ended up doing, I mean, it's a hugely deep dive. But in my opinion, it's not boring. It gives you an education in how television was run, how, how things went before things went digital. And so you had NBC, the network, waiting for the actual tapes of the Variety Hour, the first episode, to be delivered on Thanksgiving evening. And if they didn't get there on time, it would be dead air. So, I mean, this is like Keystone Cops. This is like olden days stuff. Yeah, I'm not wild about being older now, 
But I love when I was born because it was just right in the middle of the change. And you know, things went digital as I became an adult. And, you know, I, I got to meet a lot of people from old Hollywood. So I, I kind of got the best of two worlds. There was a, a hot time to be part of pop culture. There seems to be like kind of just a bubble around that time where everything is still so fondly remembered today. Because things aren't getting better today. <laughs> that, a lot of that is the reason why we're fondly remembering things. Um, even things that don't quite deserve it. I mean, I don't know. When we sat down and watched all of the episodes of the Brady Bunch Variety Hour, it wasn't like it was so bad it was good. It was just so bad. And now, like, you know, I look and I go, that was pretty cool that I got to work with all those people. And I loved doing it while we were doing it. I really enjoyed it. But I made my friends promise they wouldn't watch it. It was uh, a Sid and Marty Croft. Yeah, yeah. And I love Sid and Marty Croft as people. I adore them. They used to film Puffin stuff next door to the Brady Bunch. So I watched them film the the title shots, you know, where they're singing the song and everything. And I love going on that set because it was colorful. Visually, and I, I've always been an artist. It was the land that artists created. And I loved going on that set. But I was really disappointed when the show came out because... Aesthetically, artistically, um, it did all the things that a show, in my opinion, just what I don't like, like an overbearing laugh track, heavy handed comedy, and the style of the show. I just, I didn't like Sid and Marty Croft shows, but I have said that in the book. I feel terrible saying it because I love them. And I do think that visually they're really, they're spectacular, but I hated their shows. <laughs> I used to watch Donnie and Marie. So that I could go in my room and listen to Led Zeppelin. It would sound so much better after watching something schlocky. But okay. So that, I mean, I'm very opinionated. In my opinion, I did not like Sid and Marty Croft shows. And so it, it was almost like a nightmare to be in one. But I loved it. I, it was so much fun. I rewatched the pilot episode. It's on uh -huh. YouTube. And it is definitely of... The time, it's definitely, because this was born from the Donnie and Marie show, right? So you're- Yeah, yeah, they had the skating rink and we had the pool and our pool was next door to their skating rink. So like you and Florence, you're to blame for the variety hour because you were so adorable and fun on the Donnie and Marie show. They're like, hey, we should make a show out of this. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. Although I'd give Mike Look and Lana Maury McCormick some credit too. Yeah, the four of you, yeah guested on, on Donnie and Marie, and that is what, I think it was Marty Croft that went, wait a minute, let's give them their own show. Let's just turn the Brady Bunch into a variety show, because I remember being on the set and telling Marty, because we knew Marty. Marty used to come over to the Brady Bunch set when I was eight or nine and say, you want to come to Puffin stuff? And I'm like, yeah, wonderful, sweet, nice man. And uh, Sid, too. Like I say, I love them. And we, we did a show that they produced at the Hollywood Bowl. Well, thanks to them, I can say that I played the bowl. Been backstage at the Hollywood Bowl. And so, I mean, it's great opportunities and great fun. But he came up to me when we were doing the Donnie Marie thing. And I said, thank you. You know, this is really fun. This is something I wasn't expecting to do. And, and he said, well, I'm glad you're enjoying it because we have some plans. I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I was just like, work. When you're a kid back then, when you become a teenager, the, the labor laws were the same for a 15-year-old that they were for a five-year-old. They just don't hire you when you're a teenager. They, will hi they would hire somebody who was 18 and then put them in pigtails and a pinafore and give them a lollipop. And it was really ridiculous looking because you could always spot, oh, look at the 27-year-old playing 12. <laughs> That's just the way it was. So there wasn't work. And, 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 you know, I hadn't been very clever. I hadn't figured out that I wanted to do something else with my life. So it's like, great, a job. Fabulous. I was 15. I think I turned 16 while we were doing it. So it was just like, you know, the, this is great chance to do some work and to be with my family because there's always that. Right. Because now, flash forward. We think of all the different Brady iterations, the Bradys, the Brady Brides, all that kind of stuff. But this 
was the first one. Yes, it was. Yeah. And, and the most bizarre one. You know, I say it's the day television took the brown acid. I mean, it's just so psychedelic, so disco. And then that, that, that was the thing. I was a kid. I had, yeah, I just discovered that I really loved music and I really did not love disco. I was a prog rock girl, kind of, and hard rock. And I was get, just getting into punk disco. I mean, I was one of those people that would, you know, spray paint on stop signs and put disco, stop disco. <laughs> Because it's so horrible. Now I think it's funky and it's funny. But back then I was kind of serious and, oh, I hate this. We're doing a disco version of Toot Toot Tootsie this week. Oh. <laughs> oh, man. I do encourage anyone. I mean, TikTok has like clips left and right of the Brady Bunch. YouTube does too. YouTube has entire episodes. I, I would say this is something, I because I teach acting for kids. A lot of my students don't know who I am, but some do. And sometimes they start watching the show because I'm their teacher and they like it. And so as soon as they know who the characters are, I say, okay, this is, this is us a few years later. And this is uh, Miss Susan when she was 15. And look at dad, look at Mr. Brady. And I play for them the comedy sketch about Christopher Columbus. And Robert Reed is playing a mentally impaired Christopher Columbus. And he is in hog heaven. I remember thinking, oh, please, please don't make him sing so much because he hates it. And he's not good. Neither am I. Give him more comedy. Give him more sketches like this because he was wonderful. And so there he is, Dad Brady, Mr. Serious, wouldn't even engage in the pie throwing scene because he didn't want Mr. Brady to lose his dignity. But here he is as. Christopher Columbus, and he's hysterical. When I show the kids, they just can't believe it. Did Robert Reed enjoy the Variety Hour one to do new things, but did he also personally like it that the Schwartzes weren't part of it? That's entirely it, because you know everybody knows by now that Bob did not like being on the Brady Bunch. But Bob loved the character Mike Brady. Bob really was Mike Brady, in, in a sense, and, and his daughter... He had been married and they divorced and the ex-wife took the daughter to Chicago. So Bob kind of lost his girl. And I always felt guilty. Like we got the love that he wanted to give to her. And so we fulfilled that hole in his heart because I remember him telling me, you know, I had Karen, we had Karen and, and I knew, okay, I'm, I'm a father now. I'm a father. Okay. And it all sunk in. He goes, but it wasn't until one day that I had her in the shopping cart and we were at the grocery store and I looked down and went, I'm a dad. And he goes, that, it just hit me in one moment. And so I think from the minute he had those feelings and to lose her, it was like he had a hole in his heart. So we filled it. It seems, you know, just what you read is he loved all of you so yes. much. I'm sorry. I'm just, I have to open the door. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's the kitten. Everybody that knows me knows I'm a crazy animal lover. It's Bella. Bella, say hi to everybody. Bellatrix. Hi, Bellatrix. Yeah. I suffer from Ellie Mae Clampett syndrome. I'm very into animals. My kitties are my children. I have a, I have a human son too. Anyway, Bob wouldn't have missed the chance to work with us. Even when Sherwood wanted us to come back. You know, it's like... They really didn't want to work with Bob again. And I'm sure he didn't want to work with them. But when they asked him to be on Brady Girls Get Married, he said, there's no way somebody else is going to walk down the aisle with my daughters other than me. So, And he took all of his kids to England because he had been trained at the Royal Academy. So he wanted us, not that he was going to say that we had to be actors, but if we could be turned on by what had turned him on and inspired him. I mean, we all do that when, when we have kids. You want to go, I turn my son on to bands and, and things. And, and so he wanted to take us to England and to make it even more fun. We spent a week getting there on the QE2, the steamship. And that was out of the goodness of his heart and his wallet. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Very, very special. And he was a big animal lover too. Very special. And we got to see a side of him that a lot of people never did. I, I, 
I met a woman that had just done a play with him. And I'm like, oh, don't you love him? Isn't he wonderful? And I'm gushing all over his dying. And um, somebody took me aside. It's like, Susan, get your foot out of your mouth. He fired her. Oh, oh, I guess he, she didn't have a good time with him. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Tough when he had to be, I guess, right? Yeah. And he he was difficult. And, and it was it's a bizarre life. But to come back as an adult, and then we did this horrible show called The Brady's, I got to be with Bob as an adult to see him have a hissy fit over something that was really silly. But it's just like, I don't want to be here. I love the cast. I hate the producers. He was having a fit over Alice walking into the living room with a fully lit birthday cake. But he's like, there's no way she could have done that. And the wind would have blown them out. And I mean, there's, there's no way. This is impossible. You cannot believe this. And it's like, okay, this is a perfect example of suspension of disbelief. Yeah, the cake's lit because there's a prop guy back there lighting the cake. <laughs> but I mean, when, when the loaf of bread came out of the oven and I love Lucy, that loaf of bread was about five times the length of the oven, but we still laughed. <laughs> I was kind of a serious kid, though, that would question things like this. Like, I always thought, why did they pick that house for the exterior? Because it's a one-story house. It's, it's clearly not this house. And the same producer had created Gilligan's Island. Why did everybody pack for a three-hour tour? So I was kind of a literal kid. You kind of just threw me for a second because you're right. I never thought about the fact that they packed for a three-hour tour. Oh. Yeah. The, the house brought... The inner trunks of money. The girls brought other clothes. Oh, my goodness. The only ones that weren't packed were the ones that actually did live on the ship. The Skipper and Gilligan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so that's uh, the way I thought as a kid. I couldn't enjoy Casper the Friendly Ghost because I needed to know how he died. Uh, that's so funny. There's a lot of that serious thing in me. But by the time I grown up, I became much more lighthearted. And I'm just like, whoa, look at Bob go. And he walked off the set because nobody would support him. We're all just going, what? <laughs> was he just hypersensitive because he was just so annoyed with the Schwartzes that? Yes. So he was looking for anything that wasn't believable. But the battles he picked, man, he had a fit during the original show because he had to, when I think of the research that this man had to do to find fault with things. Actually, I mean, there was plenty of fault that could have been found easily. I could have helped him. But he had a fit because he was to walk in the room when Alice and Carol are, they're making strawberry preserves in a little competition. Who's going to have the better preserves? And he's supposed to walk in and say, it smells like I've gone to strawberry heaven. And he comes in, strawberries have no aroma when they're cooked. Like, who knows that? <laughs> no, nobody in our audience knows that. <laughs> and I've always meant to cook up some strawberries and see if it's true. I mean, you know, that's probably not the thing to have an issue with, you know? <laughs> oh, that is so funny. Oh, speaking of the uh, Schwartzes, how did they get cut out of the Variety Hour? Well, Sid and Marty Croft are very clever guys. They could have stopped it. They absolutely could have stopped it. But Sherwood claims... Because we'd already gone into syndication. Sherwood claims that he didn't want to stop the show and take a job away from the cast. It's also true that anything that promoted Brady was good for the franchise. So it helped with syndication of the original show. I, I mean, it had to have been so weird for him. And he said, and, and I see this thing, he goes, and then and they're all singing and dancing, and it's just so bizarre. And they had no right to do it. You know, he should have been a part of it if it was going to happen. But he says, Sid and Barney never asked for his permission because they knew they wouldn't get it. So, you know, it's, well, it's better to um, make an apology than to be told no. Got it. Okay. But I mean, never extremely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to interrupt my conversation with Susan Olson, but we have to take a quick break. I do want to thank everyone for their support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations, and that's how we keep the lights on. And now back to my conversation with Susan Olson. We're about to dive into Fake Jan, and we're back. So one of the great things about your book was how deep 
you went on fake Jan, Jerry Reichel. Yeah, that's not even how deep it really went. We created a holiday for her, fake Jan day. It's January 2nd. I saw that in the book. I was excited. I put it on my calendar. That ended up with being kind of a cult-like religion with all kinds of rules and regulations that I mostly came up with. That is so fun. So the idea, though, of fake Jan, that the coining of that phrase came later, right? Like when Nick and Knight was yes. bringing it back, it became sort of a, a way to hype up the Brady Bunch variety show that they're re-showing. Yes. And then the Simpsons picked up on it and they had fake Lisa when the Simpsons had their own variety hour. <laughs> Yes, in the spinoff showcase, which I dug up and watched after I saw it in the book. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, yes, licorice wet. <laughs> yeah, everybody sings and dances. <laughs> How does Eve Plum feel about it now? Now it's like, yeah, she, she dodged a bullet. But at the time, you see, she had done Dawn, Portrait of a Teenage Runaway. And that really, that should have given her the career that she deserved. And she was always very serious about acting. She wanted to continue as an actress. And so there was a sequel called Alexander, The Other Side of Dawn. And she was, she was committed to that and she was contractually obliged. But I think they could have maybe scheduled around it. And there was also this attitude of, I'm not going to bend too much to do this. Maybe it's better if I don't do it. And I think once it came out, she might have been very happy that she wasn't on it if she saw it. But I know that she did watch it. And her mother said that she cried when she saw that she was replaced. She became very emotional. I know that she certainly wanted to see us, but it was thought and it was a very logical thought that she was on to bigger and better things. And to go back and cement herself back into the role of Jan Brady could have been a bad choice. Things might not have turned out any differently, but, you know, I would think that today she might be going, if I hadn't done that darn variety show, maybe things would have been different. Well, you know, we never know. You never know. We get typecast, but as Barry once said to me, yeah, but how many actors get a chance to be typecast, how many have a job that's that successful? It wasn't monetarily successful. Well, in a way it has been, though, because there are all the spinoffs and different things. But um, yeah, sure. Did we get typecast? Absolutely. Um, did it pigeonhole us? Yes, it did. But who's to say? So when you were trying to get roles later, they'd be like, ah, oh, you know what? You're Cindy Brady. Exactly. Because the things that I would read best for would be like, you know, hatchet murderers and drug addicts and very unwholesome roles because that's what I wanted to do. And it was always, oh, we just can't cast Cindy Brady in that role. My agent would say, but Jan played a prostitute. And, yeah, but that's Jan. You know, Cindy, Cindy's too sweet. We can't have to earn. And I was like, well, yeah, if that's the way it's going to be, I really don't like acting that well. And, you know, I'd rather do something else. And I'd always wanted to be an artist. And my mother said, oh, artists are a dime a dozen. Okay. Do acting. It's a much more stable career. <laughs> Uh, you never know. You never know. I just think that's so funny. It's like, oh, no, I come on. You'll be a starving artist. You know, there's just too many artists. It's like, but every waiter is an actor in California. There's plenty of those, too. But I guess she thought that since I had a, a leg up, you know, I had a foot in the door, it would be more practical. What I wish I had done, and I think I wanted to do it at the time, but I just... I think I also wanted to please my mother, who really liked the idea of me being an actress. I should have gone to film school because I'm much better suited to being behind the camera. Writing, editing is a passion of mine. That would have been a better way for me to go. All actors say they want to direct. I wanted to do special effects. So to have an art career and get into special effects would have been much, much more appropriate for me. But, you know, today I'd be out of work anyway, because everything that I could do or would have done is now done by CGI computers. Although I might have gotten into the computer and learned to do it that way. You should download all the Variety Hour specials off of YouTube, re-edit them, make them masterpieces. <laughs> well, I did do one mini masterpiece which was the song Razzle Dazzle. It was only the second thing I ever edited. 
And I wanted to have something because we were also going to sell a mockumentary about the show. And I wanted, for people that didn't know that it ever existed, I wanted a quick video that would just give them a real taste of it. So I took a song that we we sang on the show called Razzle Dazzle, which is about being terrible. You know, Razzle Dazzle, um, they'll never notice that you have no talent. And then I put in excerpts from like every every big celebrity guest that we had on the show. So that's actually on YouTube. And it's, uh, it's, it's Razzle Dazzle, a Brady Bunch Variety Hour tri- tribute. Right. And it begins with that 70s show because there was an episode where they were watching the Variety Hour. Between The Simpsons and that, I mean, it's... it's yeah. Been, it's definitely found its way into pop culture. It's funny because Bruce Valanche was part of the Star Wars holiday special as oh, well. Oh, yeah. Well, in the canon of Fake Jan Day, when you have your Fake Jan celebration, you're supposed to be watching episodes of the Variety Hour. But if you can't find them, then you may substitute with the Star Wars holiday special. <laughs> totally fair. <laughs> Uh, it's so funny. It was interesting, not only because of that, but well, let me ask you a question. So Steve Bluestein in the in the book said that 85% of the audience probably didn't even notice. Do you think that was true? Or do you think they were so close to the Brady's? That was just... Notice what? That I'm sorry, that uh, Jerry replaced Eve. Oh, no. Okay. If he sent that around me, I, I would have said him straight. And I, I love Steve. Love, love and adore him. But no, nobody was fooled. You know, Brady fans know who we are. Maybe some older people were. I know that when I was replaced on the Christmas special, my mom's blue-haired friends were <laughs> like, oh, we would have known that's your daughter. She just looks so much like you. Mom's going, that's Jennifer Running. That's not my daughter. <laughs> but all the fans do. Steve Bluestein didn't have any interest in saying nobody would notice, but I, I do think that there was an attitude with the producers that we were all very replaceable. I'd like to say that we aren't, and we weren't. And even even if there's been years gone by, Brady fans kind of know what we look like. We may look very different. I think Mike Lookinland rarely gets recognized on the street, but you put somebody else in there. You put Mike in, in the show, yeah, okay, that's Bobby. They're not going to buy that somebody else is Bobby. I was always heartbroken when one of you... We'll call her fake Cindy, right? I mean, for the, the for the Christmas one. Yeah, we call her Christmas Cindy because I love her. She and I are good friends. Okay, so Christmas. But you knew Jerry too before she became fake Jan. Yes, I did. We did a commercial together. Yeah. So in your book, it talks about how fifteen hundred people. That was that must have been quite a uh, audition for to replace Eve to take over as Jan. Yeah. And it, it was really strange, too, because Jerry says what she had to do. And I understand singing and dancing. But for the acting element, and there was so little acting. I mean, there was there was comedy to do. And I would have seen making somebody do improv or something for the audition. But she, I think she had to do something funny. And she had to cry on cue. Well, when do you have to cry on cue? For a variety hour. It's like, thank God I had the role of Cindy because I wouldn't have passed the audition. <laughs> I don't do that. I can't just turn on the waterworks. There's not a lot of crying in the Brady Bunch. No. I mean, there's there's a little. But in a variety hour? You know, maybe if you have to listen to it too long, you'll cry. <laughs> <laughs> the Croft dancers and the water follies in that pool. I mean, that was some pretty intense pool what a synchronized swimming routines. Yeah. yeah, and so they were all dancers who could also swim. And to do all those things while looking pretty and not having a bubble coming out of your nose, extremely difficult. These girls worked so hard, so hard. And then they would rehearse into the wee hours of the morning, go through days where their hair barely ever dries because they're doing all the water stuff. And then they're doing all the dancing stuff. And they were wonderful. They were such troopers. Back to Christmas, Cindy, for a second. So why were you unavailable for a very Brady Christmas? I was going on my honeymoon. My first marriage, we had plans to go to Reggae Sun Splash in Jamaica. And um, I said, I saw Sherwood at a party. And he says something about, well, I don't know, you might want to change your honeymoon plans because we have something in store. I said, who knows? You know, send me the script. And I read the script. I thought it stunk. 
And, but you know, it's like the power of Brady compels you. I mean, I, it's not like I would have said no, but then they gave me, how do I put this? I want to be diplomatic. They were offering me like half the money that they were giving to the other two girls, which you know, usually we do a favored nation, so everybody gets paid the same. I've always thought if somebody's clever enough to get more than me, touche. Okay, you know, God bless you. You stuck to your guns. I set the price of what I think it's worth and what it's going to take to make me say yes. And so I'll say yes if I find out somebody else got more money. Well, you know, that's the way it is. This is what it took for me to, to sign the contract. And they didn't come up with what it would take for me to sign the contract. And then knowing that they were offering the other two a lot more, it's like, well, okay, I'm going to Jamaica. Yeah, I'd love to stick around and and eat the crumbs off the table, but I think I'll go to Jamaica instead. (laughs) All right. All right. I always had sort of a fantasy of sitting one out. And then when I watched it and I saw poor Jennifer sitting at children's table, I'm like, oh, I feel so bad for her. But I didn't know her then. We didn't meet until several years later. And we met at a Burger King. And we saw each other across the ball pit because our kids were playing. And we went across the ball pits and hugged each other and just kind of became friends. We did a podcast together for a while. We had an awful lot in common. I and mean, it's kind of weird. It's very weird. As she... She was a horse fanatic when she was a, a little girl. I was too. And then just a lot of like little stupid stuff. Like I like that song. Oh, I love that song. I mean, like so much stuff in common. I really, really like her and I miss her. I need to catch up with her. She moved to Wyoming. Um, she and her husband are homesteading. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So fake Jan, Christmas Cindy. Do you have a nickname for Leah who played Marsha in the Brady's? Fake Marsha. Fake Marsha. Yeah, we haven't had any contact with her. We have with Jerry. Jerry will show up at conventions and things. And gosh, when we first, I mean, it was because of the book that we we renewed our friendship. And then she came over, took parties. and She's been around the rest of the bunch. And so we've kind of stayed in touch, but we haven't seen. And Jennifer, too, in a way, because Jennifer and I had every cast member on our podcast. But Leah kind of. I think she got married and had a family and, you know, left the business like so many people do. I don't think people realize that it's not that dream job. It's not the greatest job in the world. And if you're not doing it anymore, then you must be a failure. People leave. Women usually leave to go have a family. So I think that's what she did. Don't quote me on that. But we just haven't seen her. She was lovely. You know, we enjoyed working with her, but haven't stayed in touch. I think if we have fake Jan and Christmas Cindy, we need to come up with something other than fake Marsha. <laughs> yeah, we do. We have to at least have a better name. Yeah. Yeah. So for next time. But then the Brady girls get married is when you, all of you were together again. Yeah. We didn't all get together again until I had a special um, called Brady Bunch Home Movies that I produced, but we didn't all get together in one room. We didn't get together in one room until... Still Brady? I think it was called Still Brady after all these years. It was hosted by Jenny McCarthy. Oh, the 35th anniversary? Mm-hmm. Of course, now we we did the, the HGTV show. The HGTV show, that's been in the news again because they're selling it for like $5.5 million. Yeah. I mean, somebody smart, somebody really wealthy and smart, somebody should buy it and make it a an Airbnb, but you'd have to really, I mean, it would have to be an Airbnb for rock stars, mega wealthy people, because you have to charge an arm and a leg because that stuff isn't easy to replace or fix. I think some of the appliances don't work. (laughs) So it's not really all that practical, but you can, you can gut an old washing machine and put in the new, you know, somebody can make that work. Yeah. How was uh, hanging with the crew again, the bunch, and uh, kind of recreating the house? Well, we always, I mean, I guess because as a child, I believed in magical thinking. I just always thought that there would be a reason for us to stay together. And, you know, every every so many years, there is another reason. And so that was what I wanted. And to me, it's not surprising that life has worked that way. And when we get together, I mean, we just go right back to our positions in the family. I mean, Mike and I are trying to crack everybody up. Barry is the 
the oldest and the other one that tells us what to do. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it really, we are like a family, except we don't have, we get along so much better than a family because we never had to really share a bathroom. (laughs) And, you know, it's that thing. It's the family love with that respect that comes that you have for people that are not your family. So it's really, it's really a great relationship. It's awesome. I mean, I, I speak for myself and everyone that I love when all of you guys get back together. I've always loved the reunions. I mean, it's just, just so awesome. Well, and it gives you hope. It's, it, I hear you. I mean, when bands that I love get back together, it's like, oh, yeah. And, and I think that the reason why the show was so successful is because people are a lot more psychic than they're given credit for. And I think that people knew, they knew that the love between us was real. And so when we get back together again, it just reaffirms that. I mean, really, I think the best way to put us back together again is no scripts at all and just let us do our thing, have a have a camera crew. I used to get the boys to do autograph shows with me to raise money for animal rescue. You know, I mean, then we go to lunch and we're all hanging out with each other. We're all still together. We're all joking around, getting along great. And people, like sometimes people that we really admire, that we're fans of, you know, will come over and go, oh my gosh, it's so great to see you guys. And you all love each other. You're all so fun. Or they'll be at the table with us and we're joking around. Oh, you guys are just as funny as you were on TV. And oh, we just love you. It's so good to see you. That's awesome. I've, I've heard you on the, the Brady Bros a, a couple of times. And, oh, okay. And they talk about how you are kind of like, you remember everything. So let me ask, let me ask you about the Ken Berry possible spinoff, Kelly's Kids. Yeah, Kelly's Kids. Tell me about that. I remember uh, it was a white boy, an Asian boy, and a black boy that were all going to be adopted by the Kelly family. And it was going to be called the Kelly Kids. And I remember the black kid, his name was Pop. And he went on to do the new Mickey Mouse show, New Mickey Mouse Club. I think that was the the group that had Lisa Welchel. It was before like the Britney Spears group. Okay. The, the white boy is played by Mike Lickenland's brother, Todd. And I don't remember, I didn't know the, the Asian boy. But anyway, it was, you know, the diversity family. People would come up to me and go, what was up with that episode? Now people are more savvy. They go, oh, okay, so that was a spin-off. That was a wannabe TV uh, show. Backdoor people, pilot. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, people go, why why did they spend so much time on that other family? I didn't care about them. I wanted to see you guys. It's a spin-off. I remember Ken Barry being very nice. Brooke Bundy was the wife. But Ken did something that I like to remember to do to this day. When he would talk to a child. He would get down on his knees so he was the same eye level so he could really look them in the eyes. And and Bob was like that. He didn't necessarily physically get down on his knees, but he spoke to us like we were co-workers. We weren't his kids, even though we filled that daddy spot in his heart. We were co-workers and he respected our opinion. He talked to me. I remember we, we discussed cartoons and... He discussed cartoons with me with the same level of respect that he would have discussed Shakespeare with uh, somebody his own age. Robbie Rist, how did you feel about Cousin Oliver? I was thrilled to have him on the show because this is when I started praying for the show to get canceled because I was going through puberty and I was getting uglier by the minute. They didn't know what to do with me because I wasn't cute anymore. I was like, yeah, bring in, you know, bring in the little shark jumper. Let him be the cute one. And, you know, just have me in the background fixing a bike or something. I really wanted to blend into the woodwork. And Robbie and I got along really well. We stayed friends. And um, I'm proud to say that I do believe I turned him on to music. And it was in my bedroom with my stereo that I turned him on to Queen and um, some other rock bands that, that inspired him to become a musician. I, at the time, we, we got our first guitars on the same Christmas and I wanted to be a musician, but Robbie's the one that practiced and really became one. And he's always in like, you know, five bands. He's he's constantly busy. So I, I admire him a lot for that. I love Robbie. I had him on the show 
And one of the things he did, he was part of, he did the music. It's, he did a lot of the songs in Sharknado. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did the main thing. Yeah, he's a good dude. That was great. That, that was wonderful. It was a great song, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He got killed by the... <laughs> I never saw it, okay? I'm <sighs> not cool. But he gets killed. The Hollywood slime falls on him or something. That's great. <laughs> he was in the Christmas movie that we did where we didn't play Brady's. They cast us Brady cast members as another family. A oh, blending Christmas? Yes, yeah. So was that fun to work as non-Brady's together? Yeah. I mean, gosh, we've done it all. We've made albums. We went on tour. We've worked as non-Brady's together. Sorry to interrupt. Have to take a quick break. And we're back with Susan Olson and more Brady Bunch Variety Hour. With the Variety Hour, with the singing and dancing, you sang early on, right? So you could sing. Like when I talked to what? Chris Knight, he, Chris Knight talked, it was a torture for him in the show. Yeah, it was. And, I think it was very unfair to him because they made him sing a solo because all the girls were nuts about him. And they all screamed so loud they couldn't hear him. And they couldn't hear the fact that they had Maureen backstage singing for him. I mean, Chris's microphone was off during most of our concerts. And I think it, it put a wedge between Chris and music that didn't need to be there. And I, I feel bad about it. I, I remember when he quit the band and his last show was at the Minnesota State Fair. Tony Orlando and Don opened for us. And it ended up being our last show, too, because we didn't go on and do anything. There was the Brady Three that we rehearsed for. We got costumes. And I think, once again, I prayed. It made a miracle. I said, please, God, don't let us take this on the road. It's going to be too embarrassing. And we never got a single gig. <laughs> I got power. <laughs> <laughs> power of your thoughts. I was doing that I, as much as I love touring. I absolutely love touring. It's part of why I wanted to be a musician later. I love being on tour. But I was hoping that we could do real rock. And mom would say, oh, you know, she'd dangle a carrot in front of me. Say, when, when you guys get past your image, you'll be able to, to do more hard rock. And so I loved it. And I kind of felt bad that Chris was breaking up the band. But then when, when they got just the three of us, it was me and Mike and E, we got together I thought it was really, really lame and really embarrassing. And this was one of those things that I had to do because mom made me. <laughs> so uh, I'm like, he's God, don't let this happen. Oh, man. Um, so important question. Do you, have, do you have one of the original Kitty Carryall dolls? The original mass market in the box, which the box I hear is worth a lot more than the doll because it's very rare. But the real originals, Part of the reason why I disliked that doll so much was because she weighed 10 or 12 pounds because she had a plaster of Paris head. And every time the prop master handed her to me, don't drop it. Don't drop her. Got to hang out real tight. And I was like, mm, it's that doll again. Those would be worth tons of money. There were two of them. And they are missing. Because I know some people that do archives at Paramount. Like, no, those, those were stolen quite a while ago. And perhaps they were lost because they'd never shown up on the black market, or maybe they dropped them and they shattered. That's possible, right? Ah, uh, we'll never know. We may never know. Well, uh... <laughs> yeah, mine isn't in very good shape though because I let my niece play with her. But I, I got the box. I've got the doll. Mint in box. That's uh... no, not mint. I I'm mean, saying really, like mint in box. Really it would have been. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it used to be, oh gosh, 20 some odd years ago. It was like 300. Now, I, I'm sure it would be at least 1,000. I don't know. But like I hear that the plaster Paris head ones would be worth a good 30 to 50,000. Wow. All right. Yeah. Well, maybe that's the next uh, Brady get together CSI Kitty Carry All. <laughs> you guys. <laughs> I'm sure they got broken. I'm sure that because they, they would have found their way, they would have come to the surface. I tell you, uh, you said 12 pounds. And I got to say, I think your book, The Bizarre Story of the Brady Bunch Variety Hour is 12 pounds. It's a heavy yeah. book. It's a heavy. You know, it's coated stock for printing in color because you got to have a lot of color. I, I tell you something. It's you, all glitter and, you know. You mentioned earlier, and I'll tell you, if you got, if anyone listening is, is really interested in TV history, this is about 300 pages of all goodness. 
Meaning, I don't mean it's it's not like 20 pages and then 50 pages of photos just to make up bulk. This is like all deep dive. If you're into learning uh, into like some of this you know, diving into pop culture, this book is incredible. Incredible. Ah, oh, thank you. I agree. I, I think Ted did a wonderful, wonderful job. And then we had people like like I. I mean, I, I participated in some of the interviews and I, I told Ted, I'm like, don't interview Bruce without me. I want to talk to him. I love Bruce the Lynch. And Bruce is one of the smartest people I've ever met. And the whole reason why he was on our show and the Star Wars Holiday Special was because he was told that his resume had just too much good stuff on it. He needed to have a few duds. And so when he heard there was a Brady Bunch variety hour. He said, that fits the bill. And the Star Wars holiday special, of course. But Bruce is brilliant. I love him. I ended up on a um, web series called Child of the 70s um, because the, the creator came to me. It's one of those web shows where nobody gets paid. They all do it because it was a really fun cast, really wonderful crew and cast. And in fact, I, I asked him, please make me regular on the show because I really enjoyed this. The producer came to me and said, I'd like you to do a cameo. You get to play Bruce Valanche's boss. And so I was going to get to cuss him out because I walk in and he's molesting one of his clients. We, we were an agency. I was the head agent. He was an agent. So I was his boss and he was trying to molest one of his clients. And I, I read him the riot act and threatened to fire him. I'm like, yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> And then I ended up on the show. Bruce Valanche is awesome. And Bruce Valanche was one of the very first interviews I did on this podcast. And I was so excited to talk to Bruce Valanche just because I just thought he was a brilliant writer and all that. And, and then I ended up reaching out to someone else and they're like, hey, I'd say I'd love to, for you to be on my podcast. And they're like, oh, well, if this is good enough for Bruce Valanche, it's good enough for me. And so no. I was just like, it was just, he didn't have to do it. I mean, I was a, no, it was a nothing podcast and I had just started. So I'm always, always thankful to Bruce Valanche for that. Well, that's why I grew child of the seventies too. It's like, oh, I get to work with Bruce. It's good enough for Bruce. Yeah. I get to cuss him out. Yay. <laughs> uh, so many amazing stories, Susan. Thank you for hanging with me. I'm, I'm kind of impressed. Thank we didn't you. even really talk about the core Brady Bunch. Stuff. See? So. Yeah. There's enough. Well, there's enough. Yeah. Brady reboot stuff that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was something when I did Brady Bunch home movies. That was something I wanted to emphasize. I produced that, but I didn't have as much creative say as I would have liked to. And that was one of the things I wanted to really illustrate. We had a cartoon show. We had a variety hour. We had albums. We had concert tours. We came back for this TV movie. Then there were feature films. It's like. There were so many entities of Brady, and I, I don't think that most of the public, even the people that were hardcore fans, are aware of just how many things there were. Yeah, the Brady kids, uh, I do know that like three of them had like issues, and then like their voices got replaced during yes. the middle of it. And that must have been a thing in the 70s, because Happy Days did that too, where they had the Happy Days gang cartoon. They do a cartoon version. Oh, yeah, it was, um, it was a contract thing. And I remember... I thought that they had deliberately cast unflattering voices, particularly for Marsha, because she was very upset. I, I just remember like her her character kind of sounded like a dullard, like they deliberately made it unflattering. <laughs> Not fair at all. And then the Brady Bunch movie, which I know your scene got cut from it, but from what I understand, yeah. you were a reporter for the Daily tabler no i was actually a male man male woman and cindy tattles to me but i'm like the the gossip so i'm the male woman postal worker who um is up on all the dirt on everyone oh. my cameo and mike lookinglands kind of hinged on the subplot with the dip Myers, and they cut the whole subplot out and i'm glad they did it wasn't funny the movie's so much better without it I think the movie's really good and I can enjoy it more if I'm not in it. <laughs> I Well, I'm sorry that you weren't in it. And I do agree of all those movies, meaning like the TV reboot type movies, the Brady Bunch is by far the best one. I mean, the original, the Brady Bunch movie and the scene that cracks me up the most and I can watch it. You know, there's certain scenes you can watch over and over again. 
the scene where Davy Jones is singing at the school, but all the moms start fawning. My best friend from high school and I were sitting in a theater watching. I'd been flown to New York to do publicity for the movie. And we're sitting in the theater and at first we're going, that's our high school because they filmed it at Tab Time. Like, those are our tables. And then when that happened in the first place, that version of Girl is fabulous. And, and the only thing that's different is bass line. I'm a bass player, so I, I really appreciated it. I knew most of the band performing behind Davey. And so I was going nuts like the women in the audience. And that was so cute when they, they rushed the stage. It was adorable. And that was like the come together moment of that movie to me. And, and at the time, I was producing Brady Bunch Home Movies. And we were having, there was another production that was in conflict. And so it was up to me to kind of rally all the, the Bradys together to do my show. And just memories of that song and that moment in the theater kept me going. It's like, that's the essence. That's the essence of Brady. And of course, Davey, I love him. You know, he was a wonderful guy. He was. The Monkees is one of my faves. Yeah, that, that scene is just incredible. I'm so excited that that's one of your favorite scenes too. I love it. And I, would, I got the soundtrack and I would listen to that version of Girl. And, you know, it, it would renew me and they'd go, yes, we're going to do my special. And, and, uh, and then Barry wanted, Barry wanted to get Mike Wilkinland playing keyboards and me on bass um, at one of these conventions. While he sang, and I, I was like, "Do girl, but do the grunge version of girl. It's really, you know, it's a really good song, and I love the bass line." And and he's like, "Well, I don't want to do a Davy Jones song." <laughs> and I, you know what? I can't blame him. <laughs> well, speaking of conventions, we met in 2011 at the Motor City Comic Con. I I was waiting for you to recognize me. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, no, I'm kidding. I'm joking. No, but I have your picture. Like your eight by ten. You and Mike. I met you and Mike. And I have a picture of you and Mike and me together. Oh, yay! I'm so excited. Susan, this was incredible. I can't thank you enough. Uh, It was a blast hanging out with you. My pleasure. I'm sorry if you heard cat jingling through their college. I have two cats that hate each other. (laughs) I need it both. I have to go on Facebook and get more advice. I'm supposed to be a cat expert. And um, I don't know what to do about this. They can't stand each other. One cat uh, is hard enough. We, uh, we, I had a cat and a dog, and they loved each other. I think because I had the dog first, and then we brought the cat in, and they loved each other. And then my dog passed away, and the, new, and the cat never liked Aww. the new dog, ever. I'm going to send you a video of my cat and dog that loved each other. Oh, I want to see that. Thank you. Yeah, you'll enjoy it. <laughs> Susan, thank you so much again. I look forward to uh, CSI Kitty Carol, Carol, <laughs> and uh, and all the next steps in your Brady adventure and uh, whatever you do next. All right, how amazing was Susan Olson? If you love the Brady Bunch and you love the Brady Bunch Variety Hour, or you want to fall in love with it. Check it out on YouTube, but also get Love to Love You Brady's, The Bizarre Story of the Brady Bunch Variety Hour. It's one of the best deep dives I've ever read. It's amazing. Also, check out all the great other Brady Bunch content on the podcast. Also, Bruce Valanche, we talked about from episode 17. That's a really old episode. And Steve Bluestein, episode 61 couple OG guests on the show back when it was called the Jeff Dewaskin Show. So you can check those out. We talk about the Brady Bunch Variety Hour in each of those episodes as well. And also Joyce Boulafont's episode 216. She talks about how she was actually cast as the very first Carol Brady. So much Brady goodness on classic conversations. Well, with the episode over, can't believe it. Huge thanks to Susan Olson. Had such a great time chatting with her about the Brady's. And of course, thanks to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me, and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word, and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations.